my name is Sharon Rounds. I'm Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the Warren Alpert Medical School. On behalf of uh, Jack Elias, Dean of Biology and Medicine, and Ashish Shah, Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the Paul Levenger Decoding Disparities Seminar Series. This series is a joint effort between the medical school and the School of Public Health and focuses on, the, on inequalities and health disparities that are experienced in healthcare today. Our goals for the lecture series are for us all to have a better understanding of where we need to make progress and what still needs to be learned as we work to close the gap on racial, economic, and social disparities of healthcare in America. Uh, thanks to all who work so hard to make this uh, series a reality, particularly David Williams uh, and Caroline Quo from the School of Public Health and the rest of the uh, committee and superstar team. We're also fortunate to have this series sponsored by the Paul Levenger Professorship in Economics of Healthcare, which is funded through an endowment established in 1987 to honor the memory of Paul Levenger. The gift was made by his wife, the late Ruth Levenger, their daughter, Betty Levenger Cohen, and her husband, Dr. John Cohen, who was a pediatrician in the Brown class of 1959. Now I'd like to invite Caroline Quo, who is Associate uh, Dean for, um, uh, Health, for Equity and Inclusion at the School of Public Health to introduce our speakers for today. And before I turn it over to her, I just want to mention that we do have closed captions uh, available for those who uh, need them. Uh, please enter your questions in the chat or in Q&A. We will address them at the end of the talks. And finally, this uh, talk, these talks are being pre-recorded and will be available on both the CME and uh, Brown Medical School Decoding Disparities websites. Take it away, Caroline. Thank you, Dr. Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's program. First, we will hear from Dr. Phyllis Dennery, the chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Brown University's Warren Alpert Medical School. Her research includes examining the long-term consequences of prematurity, as well as perinatal health disparities on the impact of race in medicine. Next, we'll hear from Katie Arona, a graduate of Brown's MPH program, who's currently a policy analyst at Rhode Island Kids Count. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Patrick Vivier, Professor of Health Services, Policy and Practice at the School of Public Health. His research includes a focus on health service utilization of low-income families and early life factors that impact health as well as flourishing. Dr. Vivier, along with Dr. Dennery and Dr. Werner serves on the Executive Committee of the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute. So let's turn to the topic today of unpacking disparities in child health. Addressing these disparities continue, continues to be a central focal point in both the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. As an example, the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute study will look at the health outcomes of women and infants in Rhode Island over the coming years. And having a study of this size in our small state will provide an unprecedented opportunity to address child health in our state. So without further ado, please take away Dr. Dennery. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to an opportunity to engage with you and the, the group. So today, our objectives will be to discuss indices of disparities uh, in terms of maternal morbid mortality, infant mortality, and the caveats of infant mortality that I'll go into, as well as the impact of poverty on child health in Rhode Island and um, the uh, regional and child health disparities in Rhode Island and, and, and aspects that, be, that come from educational. Um, so and it's not advancing, is that correct? Yeah, it's not. Okay, so I will share again. I think that that's what happens when it's not in, uh, initially in sharing. Know. Okay, so hopefully this will advance. Tell me if it doesn't. Did it advance? Yes, great. So this was an article in the New York Times a while back, and many of you remember Serena Williams, a star athlete, uh, was 
faced with the problem of having uh, an event post childbirth that led her to have a pulmonary embolus. And she complained to her physicians and so forth and said, I can't breathe. I'm having challenges breathing and they were not listening. She insisted on having a scan. I mean, she went the whole way and they did find a pulmonary embolus. So this actually was helpful in some way to illustrate the challenges that exist in maternal morbidity and the possible consequence on maternal mortality. How, does, how, do we, how are we doing in the US? Well, right now, what is the definition of maternal mortality? So that's the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy. So this pregnancy does not have had, it does not necessarily lead to birth, but it's termination of pregnancy and 42 days within that, what accounts for mortality and it's expressed per 100,000. And so in our country, we must say that uh, as this article pointed out, it's a national embarrassment. We rank number 55, just below Russia and just above the Ukraine in terms of our rank for maternal mortality. We had seen tremendous progress uh, up to a point, but recently the numbers have been skyrocketing in terms of increasing mortality of mothers. And if you look at other regions of the world, so of course the world, those numbers are decreasing. In developed nations, it's decreasing. But in the US, we're seeing an increase. And it peaked around 2003, uh, 2000, sorry, 13, um, and is now sort of tapering down a little bit. But our rates of maternal mortality are still 17.4 per 100,000, which is a tremendous number uh, for a developed nation. If we look at uh, maternal death rates by race, this is beginning the conversation around disparities with black women having two to two and a half fold increases in maternal death compared to other groups, whether white or Hispanic. So this is a significant challenge uh, that we are faced with. If we delve into this a little bit further, you, if we look at, for example, a state where there's, uh, mothers are insured, there are um, measures to uh, give good outcomes of pregnancies. So California rate is actually on the decline, whereas the US rate is on the rise. And in a state like Texas, where they do not have uh, the expanded Medicaid, that rate is even further increased and, and the disparities are clear. So the rates of infant, uh, maternal mortality for women of childbearing age that are insured versus uninsured is dramatic in, um, and, and the, the impact it may have on um, on their well-being and their ability to have a, a, a healthy pregnancy. If we now look at the infants, so historically we've been encouraged. If you look at this graph on the left, the rates of infant mortality have been decreasing. And one of the key events for us in decreasing infant mortality is the approach that we've taken to for premature deliveries in providing steroids to the mothers and surfactant to the infants. But you can see that the trajectory has been excellent and it's estimated at 5.59 per thousand um, live births. However, if we compare ourselves to other countries, we are again, woefully uh, inadequate we are behind Cuba, Portugal, we're on par with Slovakia, but we're nowhere near other countries that are as developed as we are, such as Finland, Japan, Portugal, Sweden, et cetera, where their rates are in the 2.5 to three per thousand. If we look at the country a little bit deeper, we can see that there are regional differences that are quite stark in the South, East, the rates of infant mortality are 
high, the index of disparity, meaning the uh, how the populations that are doing poorly are compared to those that are doing well in terms of ratios. That is significant in the Southeast, more so than any other region in this country. One of the contributors to uh, child um, mortality, to infant mortality in infants aged one month to one year of age is sudden infant death syndrome. Here's the graphic showing the distribution of uh, SIDS amongst uh, racial and ethnic groups. In non-Hispanic Blacks, the numbers are extremely high compared to the total numbers. And this is also mirrored in the Af American Indian Native uh, Alaskan populations. This is uh, related to several cultural practices that exist in these communities and um, sort of mistrust of the messaging that has gone on about the back to sleep campaign which encourages everyone to put their babies to sleep on their backs. So it, we will come back to this other piece here showing that in um, mothers of Mexican descent or in families of Mexican descent or uh, Central and South American uh, and Puerto Rican, uh, we have a very low rate of SIDS as with uh, non-Hispanic whites. Another factor, so the, the SIDS had more to do with the infants aged one month to one year. In the earlier time points, neonatal mortality in the first 28 days of life, looking at infants who were born early, if you took away the, the, the infants that were preterm, that were um, uh, very small preterm infants, the US infant mortality rate would mirror more so the rates seen in Sweden, one of the countries doing the best along with Finland, et cetera. So a lot of the contribution to infant mortality in the US has to do with premature births and small infants dying uh, as premature infants. So that tells us that the problem of prematurity is extremely important to address. So in these countries, there's better access to healthcare, there may be better environmental factors, and we'll come back to that at the end of the conversation. So here are infant preterm rates by states, and the March of Dimes has this great tool that allows you to give a grade for the performance of the country as a whole, which right now stands as a C, and regional differences. As with the infant mortality as a whole, you could see that the South East really does the worst in terms of infant mortality uh, and preterm birth. So here is the preterm rate. Infant mortality was similarly distributed in this pocket and other places seem to do a little bit better in their ability to uh, not have such high rates, although a degrade is certainly nothing to uh, write home about. So the rates of prematurity had decreased and had reached sort of a nadir. However, it's coming back up and we're seeing an increase, a slow increase in the rates of prematurity, despite the best efforts of the March of Dimes and other organizations. Just a quick pointer to Rhode Island, although this will be discussed by others, Rhode Island's grade for prematurity is a B minus, so it's already a little better. Our rates of preterm births are about 9%. And yet we still have disparities. So there's a disparity ratio of 1 to 1.14, 1, uh, where Black mothers in Rhode Island have an 11.7% rate per, per thousand rate of, uh, I'm sorry, percent rate of prematurity, whereas mothers of other origins have a better outcome. Asian Pacific, whites, and Hispanics here at 93 Although that's not the rate for whites, it is better than the rates for black. But if we recall, infant mortality for uh, various uh, ethnic groups was actually quite reasonably comparable to white non-Hispanics for individuals in um, uh, other um, 
groups except for African Americans. So black non-Hispanics have a very high rate of uh, prematurity as we discussed. The rates of prematurity if you're born elsewhere than in the US are better. So something about what we do predisposes individuals to have a higher rate of infant mortality. And this seems to even apply to whites and other groups. But the interesting phenomenon was that in Latino populations, this rate of infant mortality was actually reasonably low. This can be explained by something that people refer to as the Latino paradox, where the, their high factors for poor health are somewhat mitigated by cultural protective factors, by social supports across generation. And in some instances, despite some of these health indicators, Latino health outcomes may be similar or even at times better than whites. This is something that would be great to understand to impact that the rates in African-American communities. However, just a brief word that if we uh, let time go by, <laughs> there is a concept of acculturation and uh, there's uh, psychosocial adaptations that change a person's uh, way of being. And if in this graph here, if you look at Mexican born Americans and their rates of infant mortality, they're quite low. Uh, Mexican, foreign born Mexicans, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. And uh, whereas if you look at US born non-Hispanic whites, so the rates for Mexican born in Mexico uh, who come to America and immediately their rates are comparable to whites even better at times but then once they've been in the U.S. those rates skyrocket. In, in black populations just a few points in that it, it, there's something very disturbing that happens. This figure on the left shows what's called the baby monitor score. What that shows is that hospitals and their NICU inequality indices and what, what is shown here is that the more you have a higher quality of care, the higher your baby monitor score. For African-Americans in this line here, the dark line here, the rates are lower. Why? A 10% increase in the percent of black infants in a hospital NICU corresponded to a, a decrease in score which suggests that some sort of biases exist that dictate this change in behavior that allows us to treat these infants less well than others. And this is borne out by an uh, older study by Wanda Barfield in the military who showed that um, infants uh, from black mothers had a higher incidence of being very low birth weight than white infants despite similar access to care for military populations. Now, the, the reason that's important is that uh, some of the black mothers did not avail themselves as to the same early prenatal care and so forth that the uh, mothers, uh, the white mother, mothers did. And the disparities, although less than in the civilian population were still visible. And one has to wonder if that has to do with racism more so than racial differences. And lastly, this shows that in fact, the more segregated you are in terms of where you live, the more you live in a highly racially isolated region, the more you have odds of having a low birth weight baby. And that's for controlling for all sorts of factors. So black mothers living in a highly segregated area, and this is borne out in Detroit, in Chicago, in New York, Controlling for other uh, indicators of poor health or, or uh, poor outcomes still had a higher rate of low birth weight than white mothers. So essentially, it's a, a conundrum of uh, factors, both individual, perinatal, racial, and ethnic community factors that drive this low birth weight and this enhanced infant mortality. And I would venture to say that racism stress other environmental factors, nutrition, all of these things may further impact and, and make it more challenging to impact infant mortality in the, uh, in, in the African-American population, which is where the most of this uh, 
challenge is, is found. So I will now uh, turn it over to, to uh, Katie uh, Arona so she can present um, her talk. So thank you, Phyllis, and thank you to Brown University for having me here today to have a conversation around racial disparities in child health. I have to say it's truly a pleasure to be here speaking um, at an event hosted by my alma mater. And today I'm going to give you an overview of the current state of child health and well-being in the state of Rhode Island. And all the data that I am presenting today is from the Rhode Island Kids Count Fact Book, um, which has been our annual publication for over 25 years. The fact book provides a statistical portrait of the status of Rhode Island's children and families and tracks the progress um, across 70 indicators, which are across five areas of child well-being. So to begin with, I really wanted to set the stage um, with data related to the growing diversity of the Rhode Island child population. So the graphic here is one of my favorites that we have in the fact book um, because I think it gives you a really good visual of the growing diversity that we are observing in the state. So on the far left is the youngest age bracket, as you'll see, age zero to four. And on the far right is the oldest age bracket for the state, which is age 65 and older. So as you move from left to right, we see that diversity decreases as age increases. And in particular, age zero to four has the largest percent of the population that identifies as people of color in 2018 at 45%. Moreover, it's important to note that 25% of Rhode Island children in 2018 identified as Hispanic or Latino, making this demographic the fastest growing group in the state. Additionally, 23% of Rhode Island children speak a language other than English at home. Over 8,500 children were born in a country other than the US and 25% of Rhode Island children live in immigrant families. So from this slide, the key takeaway here is that as our state grows in diversity, we really need to ensure that our policies and programs are tailored to reflect the evolving needs of our communities. So keeping the information from the last slide in mind, we're going to shift a bit by discussing the unacceptable racial differences in economic well-being that continue to persist, as well as negatively impact the health of children and families of color in the state. So as you can see in the graph before you here, between 2014 and 2018, the median family income in Rhode Island was a little over $81,000. However, if we break that data down by race and ethnicity, we see that white families have a median family income of over $88,000 compared to just $49,000 for black families, $40,000 for Hispanic or Latino families, and $35,000 for Native American families. So in other words, the median family income for white families is more than twice that for Hispanic or Latino families and Native American families in the state. So poverty is related to every indicator that we have in the Rhode Island Kids Count Fact Book and to nearly every statistic that Phyllis and Patrick and I are gonna share with you today. Um, this is really because poverty undergirds the racial and ethnic disparities that we are seeing in our country and in our state due to the pervasive and deleterious impact it has on child health and well-being. Evidence tells us that the negative effects of poverty um, on children will last well beyond childhood into adolescence and adulthood. Poverty, as well as child maltreatment and exposure to violence is linked to toxic stress, which adversely alters early brain development that serves as the basis for learning behavior and health later in life. As you can see in this graph from 2014 to 2018, 18%, so almost one in five of Rhode Island children lived in households with incomes below the federal poverty threshold. Looking at poverty once again by race and ethnicity, we see that Native American, Black, and Latino children are more likely than white and Asian children in the state to live in families with um, incomes below the federal poverty threshold, which does mirror national trends that we are observing. Also between 2014 and 2018, 48% of Rhode Island children living in poverty were Hispanic or Latino. And in addition, Black and Latino children in Rhode Island are more than 10 times as likely to be living in high poverty neighborhoods than white children. Living in high poverty neighborhoods, which um, are defined as neighborhoods with poverty rates of 30% or more, provides fewer opportunities for children and their families. The data also shows us that Rhode Island children under the age of six are unfortunately at higher risk of living in poverty than any other age group. Evidence clearly indicates that exposure to risk factors that are associated with poverty, including inadequate nutrition, environmental toxins, maternal depression, trauma, and others, interferes with the young, ch uh, young child's emotional and physical development. 
So keeping consistent with my background in public health, I really believe that when we discuss racial and ethnic disparities in economic well-being and health, particularly as it relates to the topic of poverty, it's critical to acknowledge the root cause of the issue, which in this case is historical racism. As you know, assets and wealth are financial safety nets, and these safety nets enable families to deal with unexpected expenses and disruptions to income without having to accumulate large amounts of debt. Historic government policies that we often hear about, such as the Homestead Act, the Federal Housing Act, the GI Bill, were the foundations of the American middle class that we know today. And this was done a few ways, including facilitating home, owner, home ownership, business development, and college attainment. However, it's important to note that people of color were excluded from many of these wealth building opportunities due to discriminatory practices in housing, banking, and education. So as such, the wealth building opportunities denied to people of color in past generations continue to reverberate into the lives of their children today. And this is really evident when we look at the household wealth um, by race and ethnicity. So in the US, the median white household had just had $111,000 in wealth holdings compared to just $7,000 for the median black household and a little over $8,000 for the median Latino household. And moreover, given current events, I would be remiss um, if I didn't take the opportunity to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on poverty. So right now the, in Rhode Island, the pandemic is disproportionately impacting our Latino community, which accounts for roughly half of confirmed cases in the state of Rhode Island. Additionally, since the onset of the pandemic, Rhode Island's unemployment rate has surged higher than the worst levels in the Great Recession. Moreover, Black and Hispanic households are projected to face the greatest increase in poverty and racial and ethnic disparities may be exacerbated if people of color um, continue to face greater employment disadvantages. So moving on to some health indicators that we have in the fact book, here is a table with some high level data points just to really drive home the overarching theme of disparities um, in child and family health. So overall, although tremendous progress has been made on many health indicators, indicators across the board. Racial and ethnic disparities still persist for a number of maternal and infant health outcomes that we track at Kids Count. So at first glance here, you will see that in Rhode Island, women of color are more likely to receive delayed or no prenatal care and give birth to low birth weight and or preterm babies compared to white women. And black children are most likely to die in the first year of life compared to white children in the state. So starting off with children's health insurance coverage in Rhode Island, approximately 2.2% of Rhode Island children under age 19 are insured. Nationally, Rhode Island ranks third best on this measure with over 97% of our kids covered. To give you a sense of how children in Rhode Island are covered, around 58% um, are covered by private health insurance, most of which was obtained through their parents' employers. And like I mentioned before, um, when we were discussing poverty, younger children in Rhode Island are more likely to live in low-income families compared to older children, and therefore are more likely to meet the income eligibility threshold for Right Care, which is Rhode Island's managed care program for Medicaid. Um, additionally, approximately 67% of children under the age of three are enrolled in Right Care. And in order to achieve our goal of covering all of Rhode Island children, more steps need to be taken to reach out to uninsured children and families. So from a policy perspective, all children, regardless of immigration status, should be eligible to receive right care if their parents qualify. Um, as it currently stands, undocumented children who meet the income threshold for right care are not able to enroll in the program. And moreover, what's important to keep in mind with these statistics here is that this data is all pre-COVID, so pre-pandemic, and it may not necessarily reflect the current situations that children and their families are in. And we won't be able to see um, how COVID has impacted insurance rates until data from 2020 is released um, this time next year. An estimated 20% of children in Rhode Island have at least one special health care need. Um, and in Rhode Island, 61% of children with special health care needs have two or more health conditions. Early intervention or EI was established in 1996 as part C of the IDEA Act. And the idea um, was to enhance the development of infants and toddlers with disabilities and to enhance the capacity of families to meet their child's needs. EI provides services and supports to eligible infants and toddlers from birth through age three. So as you can see here, as of June 30th, 2019, there were nine certified EI providers in the state of Rhode Island that serviced over 2,300 children in the state. You can see the racial and ethnic breakdown before you here 
and children of color are slightly underrepresented when you compare it um, to the Census Bureau data that, um, that comes out every year. So now moving on to women with delayed prenatal care. Early prenatal care is a predictor for infant and maternal health. And women who receive late or no prenatal care are at increased risk of poor birth outcomes for, their, for both themselves and their baby. And so as you can see here between 2014 and 2018, almost 16% of women who had a birth in the state did not begin care until the second or third trimester. And looking at the data by race and ethnicity, we see that women of color across all categories are more likely to receive delayed or no prenatal care. And this is extremely worrisome um, given the alarming rates of maternal mortality among black women that Phyllis was talking about before. And there are an array of structural reasons as to why women of color may not receive timely prenatal care. Um, there is a growing body of evidence which clearly indicates that pervasive racial bias and unequal treatment of women in the healthcare system um, often that um, often results in inadequate treatment for pain creates a fault line in the trust between communities of color and the healthcare system. And later we'll discuss strategies such as increasing access to community-based doula services and increasing the diversity of the healthcare workforce um, as potential solutions to this issue. So here we have ch um, children with lead poisoning, which is a completely preventable childhood disease. Infants, toddlers, and preschool age children are unfortunately most susceptible to the toxic effects of lead poisoning. And this is because they absorb the lead more readily and also have a developing nervous system when compared to adults. Um, and lead, lead exposure even at low levels can have devastating impacts um, throughout the lifespan. So as you can see here, um, the percentage of children with elevated blood lead levels is declining both nationally and in the state of Rhode Island. Um, however, there are still disparities that persist. In low-income children, which as we discussed are often children of color, continue to be at higher risk of lead exposure as do children who live in the four core cities, which Patrick will talk about in a bit. This is largely because low-income children and those in the core cities are more likely to be living in older housing. Rhode Island, similar to other states, is experiencing a housing crisis. And unfortunately, our state has the highest percentage of low-income children living in housing built before 1980. And this is particularly problematic given that interior lead paint was not banned until 1978. So houses built after that period are at higher risk of containing lead that young children can be exposed to. So nationally, asthma is one of the most common chronic conditions among children. Children of color and those living in poverty nationally and in Rhode Island experience the highest rates of asthma. And there are racial and ethnic differences in asthma prevalence. And shown in this graphic, um, children who are um, Hispanic or Latino or black are more likely to um, visit the emergency department or be hospitalized as a result of asthma. In Rhode Island between 2014 and 2018, like I said, children of color and also those who are under the age of five were more likely to visit the ED or be hospitalized. Terrific. Well, I, I want to acknowledge uh, and, and make sure we uh, stay on time, but also thank uh, uh, the rest of the team at the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute Data Corps uh, who worked on, on this data and do so uh, regularly to try to address uh, health disparities for children. One of the issues that Phyllis brought up uh, na nationally is the issue of uh, segregation and concentration um, around racial and ethnic groups. If we look in Rhode Island uh, at uh, race and ethnicity of Rhode Island children, this is the breakdown on the left uh, overall for the state. But if you look at this breakdown, comparing the core cities and the non-core cities, you see a substantially different uh, racial ethnic uh, breakdown in terms of uh, families of color uh, living in the core cities. And as we look through some of the slides that I'll be going through, really what we have found is really the important impact on child health of where children live. And we know that in Rhode Island, uh, there's a big racial segregation of where that is. So again, if we look at poverty and try to map it in the state, uh, if you look at overall poverty rates in Rhode Island for children living in poverty, it's around 18%. But if you look at the core cities, uh, it's as high as 34% for children in those core cities. And as the previous slide said, uh, children of color are much more likely to live in those uh, core cities. Now to drill down in some of the health and education indicators that you've seen so far, 
uh, we want to try to look at the uh, impact of both living in a core city as well as race and ethnicity. So here we're looking at in, uh, inadequate prenatal care. And if we look at the um, a darker color, that's for uh, folks in the core city and the lighter blue is for those in the non-core city. And so what jumps out as you can see that there are these racial and ethnic differences, whether it's in the core cities or in the non-core cities, but this major difference within racial, each ethnic, racial and ethnic group of the impact of living in the core cities. Similarly, if we look at infant mortality and we see the differences across the racial ethnic groups, as well as the impact of whether one lives in a core city or not in a core city. And both of them are having important uh, impacts on that health indicator. If we now go to overweight and obesity, uh, there is a major impact, a big difference between the race ethnicities. And this, if we look at obese specifically, the obesity rates for Hispanic and non-Hispanic black are at 23% versus non-Hispanic other at 16% and non-Hispanic white at 15%. And when we look at this geographically uh, on your right of the map, the, um, that issue of core cities, and we look at places like Winsocket, Central Falls, Pawtucket, uh, and if we had this more fine into parts of Providence, you'd be able to see the impact of living in a core city for this health indicator as well. Again, immunizations, uh, looking at three different points of nine months and two years. By the time children get into kindergarten with mandatory immunizations, uh, you see a little bit less of a difference, but still non-Hispanic white, more immunized, but you see more pronounced differences at nine months and two years. And again, what does this tell us about access to care and a range of other issues of children getting the services that they need? Lead poisoning, Katie mentioned earlier, and again, want to drill down a little bit more in this really important public health issue. As we know, lead poisoning will pick off IQ points that will not come back. So this very uh, preventable early life exposure has a lifelong impact that's very important. And if we look at this of prevalence of elevated blood lead levels at greater than or equal to five micrograms per deciliter, again, we see a racial ethnic differences with this ranging from 18% in Hispanics to 23% in non-Hispanic blacks. 21% non-Hispanic others and 16% in non-Hispanic whites. Very strikingly again of this impact of where you live is the difference even within each racial and ethnic group between uh, data that I just gave for the core cities and those living in the non-core cities where they're more like 11 and 9%, 13% across these groups. What will be even more striking is when we look at this geographically and I always ask that people sort of first look at the legend of this is a graph of lead poisoning in Rhode Island by block groups. For those who haven't heard of the term of block groups, the census divides the state up into uh, block groups, which are smaller than a census tract. There are a little over 800 block groups in Rhode Island and they're based on density of population. So if you look in the Western part of the state, the block groups are bigger Whereas in urban parts, they get quite small because the block groups are based on how many people are there. But if you look down at the legend, when we're talking about disparities and really the extent of disparities, in this case, based on where you live, there are block groups in Rhode Island where this is over a decade of data, not a single child had been poisoned with lead. And if you look at the highest risk block groups, these are based on quintiles and the highest quintile, but within that highest quintile, those of the highest risk block groups, it's almost 40% of the children have been poisoned. Again, with a problem that can be lifelong lasting. And if we look at the map, these are heavily concentrated in Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Winsocket, the core cities. And when we try to understand that, if we look at the next map, we also see in these quintile maps where red is the most, there are block groups where there's no, uh, really no poverty based on this definition and others where the block group is can be 88% of families living in poverty. And if we look of where that red is concentrated, again, particularly in the core cities. And if we look at the etiologic factor for lead, specifically, uh, most commonly old housing. And in this case, we look at pre-1950, 
as uh, Katie mentioned, 1978 is when the lead paint law uh, kicked in, but there was some decrease in the use of lead voluntarily by manufacturers. So we use the 1950 cutoff as to really get at old housing where we're really confident there's lead there. Again, heavy concentrations in these core cities, which going back to my first slide, we know are much more heavily um, families of color and concentrated in those, those areas. So as we think about disparities, this example of lead poisoning is really important to think about the important impact of racial segregation and the impact of where a child lives on their health. To cover some additional really important, uh, what I consider health outcomes is to look at uh, educational outcomes. And this is specifically third grade reading proficiency. Uh, we have a problem for all populations in Rhode Island of third grade reading not being nearly as high as it should be, which is critically important because grades K through three is learning how to read and fourth grade on is reading to learn. And so this important milestone is to me a health milestone. We look at a lot of things to try to maximize development in the preschool time period. If our kids are not reading in third grade, something is going wrong. And if we look at the differences across um, racial ethnic groups, they are striking. From Hispanic on this slide over to non-Hispanic whites, big differences. To get an indicator of income for this group, we use free lunch. So free lunch is obviously a very good thing, but it is a marker of poverty. And there's specific different income cutoffs from free lunch to reduced lunch to no subsidy. And as you see that, you see this marked increase in reading levels. And so if you go from Hispanic or non-Hispanic Black who are on free lunch, which is the lowest income groups, it's only 22 to 24% are reading proficient in third grade. If you go to whites who are in no subsidy, the higher income group, that gets as high as 61%. So again, striking disparities based on race, ethnicity, and based on income. And if we look at the map, we also know that this is about where you live and the range of factors that go into that. When we think of factors that contribute to this, I want to just point out one, and that is absenteeism. To be able to perform and develop in school, you need to be in school. And if we look again at racial and ethnic differences, and even more striking, the differences between core city and non-core city, it is striking. So for Hispanics, 25% to those in a core city are chronically absent compared to 15%. And uh, again, if we look at uh, non-Hispanic white, not so much in the difference in the non-core. I mean, in the core city, everybody has a great deal of absences. Uh, in the non-core, 8% versus 15%. So again, both things are acting. And why we bring this up of the importance of absenteeism, just as a sort of final connecting this, is for all uh, race ethnic groups put together, attendance in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, is heavily associated with whether kids are reading proficient in third grade. So in the example of kindergarten, if for those who have uh, low uh, chronic, low absenteeism, 48% uh, of them are reading proficient compared to those in kindergarten with excessive uh, absenteeism, 17%. And so that tracks throughout the grades in school. So as we look at this, uh, what this data really shows across all of these slides is the importance of racial and ethnic differences in the state, and importantly, the contribution of that of where children live. So Phyllis, I think we go back to you to take us to the next step of what can we do about this? It's, it's one thing to be able to show these disparities that are disturbing, but how can we get past them? So it's nice to hear about, well, it's not nice, it's uh, rather depressing to hear about all these uh, issues of disparities, but how, what are some of the potential solutions? I wanna point out a couple of examples across uh, the states where there was an addressing of problems that then led to better outcomes. So for example, in, in Washington, DC, I, the problem was that it was very difficult for uh, mothers to get prior authorization for uh, managed care, and it was very variable across groups. So when the state decided, the, the region decided uh, to remove this prior authorization requirement for all the uh, managed care organization, then processes were streamlined and providers did much better. And 
with a partnering, uh, a collaboration between public health entities, public insurance, medicine, and other uh, strategies, the District of Columbia was able to impact the, 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 um, the, the challenges that existed in uh, maternal um, poor health and in infant mortality. So what they're doing now is a two-year pilot to track, track this progress using electronic medical record, also using a mobile app to help track the women in the group and to do social marketing campaigns to, to target the lack of perceived risk of preterm birth. This was an initiative to help reduce preterm birth and it was felt to be successful. Um, in California, seven out of 10 black women had experienced incidents of racial discrimination when they sought prenatal care. That's, that's staggering. And they worried a lot about racial discrimination because it, it is something that impacts the outcome, preterm birth, maternal hypertension, maternal depression. So what was the solution? So in uh, 14 local health jurisdictions where they ha had the bulk of patients who were black, they worked together to improve birth outcomes by addressing and focusing on toxic stress associated with chronic racism, other strategies to reduce stress and developing life skills in the population, developing resilience and providing com complementary case management. And as a result of this, this led to an improvement in the black preterm rate in California between 2007 and 2017 in many of the areas that were uh, part of this local health jurisdiction. And they then went on to establish a perinatal equity initiative. So these are just a few examples to show that sometimes one cannot give global blanket answers, it has to be targeted to the populations most at risk. If there is a communication and enhancement of patient satisfaction, there will be adherence and better health outcomes. And also, I mean, uh, Marshall Chin, who is uh, at the University of Chicago, talked about the fact that no matter how much extra insurance coverage and genetic ger ger generic efforts uh, exist to help with the quality of, of care, it has to be that there are clinicians that are dedicated to identifying the, in the health barriers in the disadvantaged populations and to build trust and to remove some of the negative uh, healthcare experiences. So this is a lot of hard work and it's not something that can be accomplished by just uh, providing uh, covered health. The, the example in the military reflected that, as I mentioned, that uh, despite having access to the care, the care was not as well utilized in populations that were not trusting of the healthcare services. So what about Rhode Island? And I would like Katie and uh, Patrick to chime in here. Uh, please unmute yourselves. But um, there has been an intensive collaboration between Maternal Child Health Program and United Healthcare as one example. And this, uh, they're then uh, using evidence-based strategies to reduce some of the risks in preterm births, for example. Uh, how do we do that? And uh, uh, Katie, if you don't mind, you had a slide and I'm, I don't believe it ended up here uh, to focus on what some of the initiatives that were done to help with uh, reducing uh, risk to mothers by providing them support as, such as uh, doulas, et cetera. Within the last few years, we've really heard um, from women of color in the state of Rhode Island and from um, doula advocates that doulas are a key method to address the disparities that we were talking about um, in the area of maternal and infant morbidity and mortality. And this is done really by doulas um, delivering a higher quality of culturally appropriate as well as patient-centered healthcare for women, particularly those who are low income or women of color. Um, and so I didn't know what a doula was prior to this work. So for those who don't know, a doula is a trained paraprofessional and they provide continuous support before, during, and immediately following childbirth. And what's great about this initiative is that not only um, does it have the community support, but it also has um, the science and a robust evidence base behind it. 
Um, support from a doula during labor and delivery is associated with really an array of approved outcomes um, for both the mom and the baby's health, including shorter labors, um, lower C-section rates, higher um, five-minute APGAR scores. And babies who were born to moms who had the support of a doula were less likely to be um, low birth weight and more likely to be breastfed. So it really hits on a lot of those disparities that we were talking about. Um, and we're actively working on that initiative alongside some other community-based organizations and partners. And uh, I would like Patrick to speak uh, about the, the, what are our unique opportunities here in Rhode Island? Yeah, I think part of the, the excitement for us in the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute is really bringing together what is unique in Rhode Island, where we have one medical school, one school of public health, one children's hospital, one children's psychiatric hospital, a birth hospital where 80% of Rhode Island babies are born, one health department, no city county health departments, and incredible community groups like Rhode Island Kids Count. Uh, to bring all of those resources together, we have an ability to address these disparities that more uh, disparate uh, systems in other states are much more challenged to do. And within the Institute, we have great examples of that. The asthma team working with schools and uh, community groups, our healthy weight team working with housing authorities and the Rhode Community Food Bank, our autism team working uh, with a range of racial ethnic groups to make sure there's sensitive services around uh, testing. And our partnership with the governor's office and all state agencies around this uh, terrible disparities in third grade reading and to try to come up with solutions. So while we have, as, as Phyllis said, these sort of depressing numbers to look at, we hopefully can get energized to, to really do some of this innovative, to innovative work. And, and I'll stop there because I know there are some questions and I wanna make sure we have a couple minutes to go to those questions, but I think we have tremendous opportunities. I would agree. Uh, we are happy to entertain questions. I uh, thank all of the panelists, and I also want to thank the, um, the, 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 the professorship that has sponsored this talk. Uh, thank you very much for uh, putting uh, us in front of you to answer as best we can the issues at hand. Bravo, wonderful job, all of you. And I'd like to uh, please uh, welcome the uh, participants to enter uh, questions or comments into either the Q&A or the chat function. So uh, one question that comes up is uh, whether there's data that separates Hispanic non-white versus Hispanic white populations and whether there are disparities uh, between these groups. I'll answer first and then Katie might have more, more data from an Island Kids Count. We found in our data sources, it can be difficult. It's an excellent question. And I think a really important question. One of the challenges that we have is that when we present this data, these are really separate questions that are usually asked of what's your race ethnicity and what's your ethnicity and what's your race. Um, we find a lot of times in the data, if Hispanic is answered, sometimes the race question is not answered and there's a lot of missing variables. So we've not been very successful in, in looking at that. I'll have our team look at it a little bit more. And if this person wants to email me, I, I can follow up. But we've not had great success in that in the past because of that issue. Katie, do you have any other different data experience? Yeah, I don't have anything different, unfortunately, to add. Um, I think there is a push. I've seen it in the Asian American community um, to get more granular with the data and to not treat that racial and ethnic group as um, you know, being homogenous, but rather th there's a lot of differences based off of whether you're Filipino, you're Chinese, et cetera. And so I think that's a push that the Latino community is doing as well. And so far as um, what Rhode Island Kids Count has done, um, I can work with our data partners actually. So all the data come from um, our partners in um, state government and um, some other key um, organizations such as Hassenfeld, for example, who um, give us data. And so I can have conversations with them about whether or not we could get more granular. Um, but like Patrick said, sometimes that question just simply isn't answered. Um, and frankly, I don't think we ask the question of race ethnicity in a way that's conducive to getting um, that exact answer that you want. And so that would be my, my response to that really good question. Okay, here's a question from uh, Jim Padbury. Um, have uh, in in terms of thinking for thinking about solutions, has there been consideration of creating a task force uh, to address this, uh, perhaps similar to a previously successful prematurity task force 
uh, including um, uh, multidisciplinary providers, agencies, nonprofits, payers, et cetera. I'm happy to answer that question. Um, I think there actually is a prematurity task force that's spearheaded by the Department of Health. Um, I'd have to go back into my email and look at that, but I think I'm actually on that. Um, so I should, I should know a bit more about it, but um, not quite related to prematurity, but in a way is, is the first 1000 days of right care. Um, and that's being led by Rhode Island Kids Count in partnership um, with our colleagues at the Rhode Island Medicaid office. And what that is, is it's a really unique and diverse group of stakeholders, whether it be um, uh, medical professionals and um, primary care providers, academics, advocates, and consumers all sitting around the table with Kids Count and Medicaid talking about from a budgetary perspective um, each year, what should we be focusing on and making recommendations to improve um, the health and well-being of children, of children age zero to three um, through, um, I guess, the yeah, through Medicaid essentially. And so that's something that we have talked about and there are discussions about prematurity being um, you know, a main topic that we try and, 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 and work on improving through a budgetary. Um, I, th I think the question was whether this could be expanded to other aspects of mm -hmm. child health disparities. Yeah, I think as, as, as is always, I think Jim is bringing up an excellent point and can we model um, rather than having this focused on one health issue like prematurity, we've shown a lot of data today that these trends of disparities cross individual health issues. And if we're going to get at solutions to these, they're going to need to get at some of these underlying issues that cross different health issues. And I think it's an excellent suggestion that we in the maternal and child health community uh, should really focus on of how we bring everybody together as part of the mission of the Hassenfeld Institute but to really focus on this issue of disparities is going to take something like this. I think it's a great idea from Jim. Oh, and Jennifer Levy says the prematurity task force is working on becoming a perinatal quality collaborative. So it's helpful. So uh, Pat Flanagan uh, wants to give a shout out to the health equity zones and the work of the Rhode Island Department of Health uh, as a very important and valuable foundation for building trusting relationships and uh, giving uh, minority populations in Rhode Island a voice uh, and also an opportunity to listen uh, for opportunities and solutions. Um, yeah, that's very important. important. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. A very, very important point. Uh, there's been a lot of work done with the Rhode Island Department of Health to uh, work on uh, uh, those issues. And um, the health equity zones have been a tremendous partnership also with uh, the Hasenfeld Institute and others to drive uh, better health in uh, key uh, populations around obesity and asthma and other and other um, mm -hmm. aspects of health. So I'm sorry that that was not brought up in any uh, formative way in the presentation. Yeah, I want to agree and also acknowledge how fortunate we are in Rhode Island to have our Department of Health Director, Nicole Alexander Scott, who has really championed this. And when you see these maps of where these problems are, the solutions have to be in those same communities. And she's just done an incredible job with the health equity zones. Here's a question. It says it's addressed for to Katie, but I think it uh, perhaps to all. Um, uh, what's this? How seriously are these disparities being taken um, by our legislators? And what's the political climate for making progress here? I think prior to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know that really took off during, um, during COVID. Um, there was some, I think I had a lot of conversations with legislatures surrounding um, the disparities that we're talking about and making it very clear that the evidence shows that this isn't um, entirely genetic. It's not race, it's racism, like Phyllis said earlier. And to have that conversation with them and to educate them on, um, this is what systemic racism is, and this is historical racism, and this is how we are seeing um, you know, old policies that were historically discriminatory impacting the current generation today. And what's great is that a lot of legislatures are very open to having those conversations, and many of them already know this themselves, which is great. Now that we are in um, an era where Black Lives Matter is really at the forefront of a lot of the social um, conversations that we're having, which is wonderful, I think more people are receptive and open to hearing um, that. And I look forward to, um, to, yeah, to seeing how that plays out in the next legislative session. 
So the, the good trouble is having an impact then. That's I would agree. Yeah, I think um, that there was not a lot of uh, time to really go into the concept of whether it's race or racism, but mm -hmm. it's pretty clear that race is a social construct in a lot of ways and that racism is really where these problems lie. And I suspect that in answer to the question about the non uh, non-black Hispanics versus black Hispanics, that it probably aligns more with race than it does with, I mean, with perceived race in terms of color versus where, whether it, it's about Hispanic versus non-Hispanic. Um, but that would, uh, would be great to have better data to understand that better. How can we as students and medical healthcare professionals uh, try to address these uh, disparities uh, within our clinical work and our research. I think that's the effort we all have to take up. I, you know, for those who are interested in this, particularly at least on behalf of the Hasenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute, I think Phyllis and I, as well as speaking for Erica Werner, the third member of our executive committee, welcome people to reach out who want to get involved in these issues. And I think, you know, similarly the Hezes, there's lots of places for people to reach out and connect. Is there, is, are these health disparities perhaps linked with access to primary care for children? The, the challenge, so here we actually at, at Hasbro Children's Hospital take care of a great majority of the kids who are in those underserved uh, core cities uh, in our, our, pri our primary care practice. There is access issues as, you know, transportation, that sort of thing. But in general, we have done a tremendous job of opening that clinic to allow for, for example, during COVID time, there was a tremendous decrease in the number of vaccinations of kids because uh, people were afraid to come to hospitals. The group at Hasbro worked very, very hard to improve that vaccination uh, number and to get back to pre-COVID rates, for example. And we've tried to also advocate to help the private pediatricians, the pediatricians in the community to get access to, get access to resources to help support their, their care of these patients who are very vulnerable. There's so much uh, to do yet, but I think that the uh, the challenges that, that exist in terms of access have a lot to do with uh, not being able to get to where we are. We are doing televisits and all sorts of other things to help prevent some of this, but to an extent, there's still some gaps that, that, are, that need to be addressed because these are, have to do with poverty, with parents who can't get there, parents who don't have the resources. Yeah, and I would add to that, Sharon, I know there was another question I think from you of are there practices or resources are lacking in some of these core cities or other areas? You can go to our website at the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute where we've mapped practices uh, for pediatrics and OBGYNs, and they are in those places, but it gets very tricky as Phyllis is, is bringing up issues of what does access mean and language or just a short distance may be a very long distance without a car or you work a shift where it's not open. Yeah. So getting at, are there practices, are there places? The answer really is yes. Can families and really understanding the full number of issues that prevent families from getting to those places uh, is much more complicated and not such an easy answer. Okay. Well, clearly lots of uh, work left to be done and um, thank you all and also to the audience uh, for the great questions. I think we see perhaps a couple of ways forward uh, and uh, that's really the goal of the series is to uh, help us uh, figure out how to improve the situation. So th again, um, Kudos uh, for a terrific uh, presentation and uh, we'll uh, look forward to next week's uh, talk, which will be on uh, disparities in respiratory diseases. Uh, so see you later, everybody. And thanks again. Thank you very much.